Hello, welcome to this stuff. I'm Nat. And I'm Ozzy. And uh, this week we are doing, at the suggestion of both Dan Hawkins and Dave Russell, thanks for that, we're doing our top five game shows. Yeah. And if anyone else has any suggestions, you can put it in the comments or catch up on us on any of our social media channels. And I think we're list off pod everywhere. List off pod at. Yep. And uh, game shows, just to be clear, it includes quizzes, competitive shows, that kind of thing. Panel shows. Panel shows, but not talent shows, right? No, I've got no talent shows. I, I was thinking talent shows is like a separate thing because it's not a game show. It's not a, it's a separate no. thing. And not reality no. TV shows, even if they sing about it being a game show. Uh, no, not on mine either. But I was thinking about that. Mm. Killerfish. Uh, you could probably do a separate one for that. Well, I'm sure we'll get around to that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my number five is You Bet. You Bet, classic ITV 90 show, originally hosted by Bruce Forsyth for, I think, one or two years. I don't remember that. Before its main run, where it's hosted by Matthew Kelly, before its sort of tail end, where it was eventually hosted by uh, uh, Darren Day for, I think, maybe one series, co-presented by Diane Udell Jett from Gladiators. Um, uh, but in its heyday is probably the, the Matthew Kelly era. The, um, the Bruce Forsyth one, when he did it, he used to end it by doing one of his like catchphrases, call and response catchphrases, like, nice to see you, see you nice. But this was, do you want to bet on it? You bet. <laughs> then you better get on it. You bet. So get ready. Get set. Are you ready? You bet. That was his. That was his big call and response with the audience. Um, it didn't catch on as well as some of his other ones, <laughs> no. to be fair. But like, pass me by. Yeah, but but he definitely had one for it. Uh, you bet was a kind of. It was like a challenge show, I guess. So it was like a, a, a team of celebrities, a pan of celebrities. I think you had three celebrities. It'd have to pick whether a member of the public could do could complete a challenge. But what was special about it was the challenges were like insane. It was like um, people who in no other way would they be on TV. Uh, so they're members of the public doing mad things. Uh, one I specifically remember, it would be like, um, could you get like a train buffer uh, and a train and try and have an egg in between? Can you park an egg where it'd be, uh, it would suspend it in the air without breaking the egg. <laughs> so you've got to move a train so slowly, like a whole massive train. And they also did another one with eggs where they got like diggers. C could you take the top off an egg, like a, a dippy egg with like a, a big digger, uh, like claw? <laughs> it was all like that. It was like, it was like, this is insane. Uh, it was a good one that I've watched several times on YouTube, which is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, a bloke it's a little um yeah, well it's not a bloke it's 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 a girl who's i think she's a teenager and she has to try and guess uh cast members of the bill if you can only see their ears um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the most 90s great... itv thing i've ever heard of <laughs> and it's good because it, it's got the, the panelists are john virgo from big break and Bob Carroll jeans, and Raffi Kelly asks him, "Do you think? Do you think she could do it? Do you think she can do it?" And John Virgo says, "Yep, yeah, I definitely think she can do it. She's got great recognition because I asked her to name all of the Sri Lankan cricket team, and she could." And it goes to Bob Carroll jeans. He goes, "Do you think she could do it?" And he goes, "No, because when he was telling John Virgo about the Sri Lankan cricket team, um, I spoke to her afterwards, and she thought that was Matthew Kelly." <laughs> So she goes. I don't think she, I don't think she can do it. <laughs> there's another uh, one. Is um, there's a guy in a soundproof uh, box, and he has to tell, identify the Queen track from uh, by looking, looking only at a speaker 
and seeing how the sound from the speaker moves a flame in front of the speaker. It's kind of, it's so like, the challenges are so specific and so kind of insane, but it's that, um, it's almost like, it's one of those ones that you don't really appreciate how mad it is. There's something about that time that makes you kind of just accept these things as like, oh yeah, that's what happens on Saturday night. And now I think it's like, I think that show would be massive. I just, I, I'd be so excited to see it. But it was big at the time. I mean, it was like prime oh, time. Huge. So was it like 6, 6 p.m. or something? Mm, mm, yeah. And it had like a huge studio. I really remember that. Like it had like yes, an absolutely huge studio for, they didn't really do that. Sometimes they did challenges in the studio, but mostly they were, you know, uh, outside. Yeah, you'd have, you'd have outside broadcast ones and somewhere you'd bring people in. Yeah. You had a bit of variety to it. It was like, yeah, it's... Um, uh yeah i i think it I, I appreciate it much more watching things back on youtube now i mean then you don't have to watch the whole show which is probably the benefit but it is like um uh, it's a lot of fun trying to catch up on it and i think matthew kelly holds up better as a as a 90s host than many of his uh he does he's era. all right he's quite charming hmm. so some of those other guys are a bit sinister and uh or just <laughs> were always awful <laughs> also, it says something about Matthew Kelly that when he leaves and he's replaced by Darren Day, the show basically folds. You know, he does like a series with not even Diane Udell, Jack can save it. But um, there aren't many. There aren't many game shows that can survive a long-standing host leaving. You know, it really. Well, there, mm. are, there are obviously some, but it, it's the, the host is very tied in with most. With most of them, the host is very important to the thing. Yeah, you're right. Actually, I think I think you do identify certain people with certain hosts, and when they've gone, it doesn't really sustain. Mm. I guess the sort of '70s examples: Generation Game had Bruce Forsyth and Larry Grayson for a long period. Mm. Blankety Blank had Terry Wogan and Les Dawson. But yeah, it is rare. I think mm. like it does feel like now you know Family Fortunes um, is a great show format. But I can't really watch it if it's not Les Dennis. I find it like, who's this? It doesn't interest me. Why are you talking about that? My number five is Family Fortunes uh, <laughs> slash Family Feud, the the American original. And um, I put that in there because although, yeah, your Les Dawson Family Fortunes is very much the one I grew up on. Les Dennis. Quite, sorry, yeah, Les Dennis. <laughs> not Les Dawson. That would be better, probably. But no, but the Les Dennis Family Fortunes is what I grew up with, but I uh, one of my late night uh, YouTube holes that I fall down is like uh, fun, like clip roundups of clips from quiz shows and game shows that are funny, mm -hmm. and most of them will be Family Feud from the seventies, eighties, and in, and even more recently. So I've watched a lot of. Um, that's why I'm confused. Richard Dawson, it's the American. Oh, okay. See, Richard Dawson is the is the Family Feud presenter, and then more recently Steve Harvey. And do you know who presents it now in America? No, it's Joey Fat One of NSYNC. That's the <laughs> that's the presenter of Family Feud now. But yeah, I watch the Steve Harvey ones as well, even though I hate Steve Harvey, but I think he's really well suited to doing the Family Feud because w what you have to do is someone says something stupid and you look at the camera and that's it. Like you just turn to the camera and pull a face. That's your job, you know? Yeah. And while everyone else laughs and the family laughs, you just kind of go shake your head or what? that's easy. He can do that. So it's very much playing to Steve Harvey's strengths, but yeah, I, you say I, that, but then I, I think over here, it's really suffered when it hasn't got someone who can do it. I mean, it looks like an easy job, but I think the people that seem to have done, done it since Les Dennis don't seem to be able to bring out, the kind of the sort of fun of it did that woman off emmerdale do it for a while or did she just i think do... she did she did you've been framed didn't yeah, she yeah. for a bit she may have done it though it may this might be a thing anyway this may the, be a thing the format is brilliant right like it's yeah. it's it's just here's an easy question what are the most obvious answers that the most people would have picked and that's great and it, the thing that's great about it is not that it's easy and people get it right it's that it's easy and people get it wrong like that's it's that kind of game show it's like i can't believe you couldn't think of a fruit that is a fruit you know people are like name a fruit and they'll be like a shoe you know it's like you put people on under pressure on the tv and they just 
just mess it up and there'll be funny innuendo stuff and it had probably the best best noise in all of game shows yeah yeah that was one of the big things for it. that's that's top um, I always like Les Demis's if it's up there, I'll give you the money myself, catchphrase. Yeah. And it, and, and I think that's so synonymous with the game show, but it's also so synonymous with Les Dennis. Other presenters know they can't do it. Yeah. It'd just be a cheap ripoff. Yeah, I think he's I think he's got that all over it. Um it, yeah, and it is. You do get funny answers. There's the ones where it's like uh, name something red and there's like my cardigan and all those kind of uh, <laughs> yeah, famous, gonna, famous gonna answers. Be, it's not gonna be up there. Uh, one of the good ones, I think, was uh, name a bird with a long neck, and he said Naomi Campbell. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is lots of lots of good ones. There's lots a lot of good ones. There's a lot of that. There's a guy I've seen. There's a good one to check out on YouTube, which is again from the British one, where a bloke. Do they do the 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 quick fire thing at the end, where you have to go through several things with the same contestant, like yeah, uh, name a so. It's one guy who just, for every answer, keeps saying turkey, 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 turkey. And then he becomes sort of, uh, and he starts laughing. He becomes slightly hysterical <laughs> and he can't think of any other word but turkey. So just keeps saying it over and over again. That's worth checking out. No, I love lots of good that. stuff. Lots of good stuff on. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's a, it's, a good, it's a good content generator is Family Fortunes. I think it's probably better watched in the format of YouTube clips as well. Like probably together because then you just probably. get all the good stuff. Yeah, and I, I think it's had, although I think you're right, I think the British version has just the one host, but in America, I think, I think, uh, I think Steve Harvey, who is, who is awful, uh, did a good job of it as well, as well as Richard. I Johnson. think Monkhouse might have done it before Les. Yeah. I think he might have been the Bruce Forsyth of, uh, yeah, he did. Of, uh, but again, yeah. I think it's that thing where you get someone for a series or two and then you get someone for 15, 20 series. It's, I guess that's that. Maybe that's a, a thing that they do. Maybe they bring someone in for the first series on ITV who's a big name who can sell the format, and then when the audience is familiar with the format, they bring in someone cheaper I, that can yeah, kind of I, bed in the series. I would imagine it's that. It's like you sign them up for a big contract, and then two series in, when it's not the big such a big news, you know, big new event, you go, yeah, we kind of need to cut the cut the because you're only going to be paying them more every contract extension. So you yeah, yeah. someone in at a lower level so that you can start going up. Yeah. Family Fortunes, I think, was at one point hosted by its own warm-up man, who was like a warm-up man who became the host. Um, and I think now it's presented by Gino De Campo, who is one of those one of those people I find incredibly unpleasant. Um, so yeah. for a while, it was in, in, uh, presented by that guy who looks like Anton Deck. Do you know that guy? And he looks like and looks like both of them. Looks like both of them rolled into one. Oh yes, yeah, it was Stephen Mulhern. That's the guy. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah, he's like he's describing Anton Deck in the goes through the machine in the fly. Yeah, and he comes out the other yeah. end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with yeah. charisma. <laughs> anyway, that's my five. Family fortunes slash family feud. Good choice. Oh! My number four is through the keyhole. Of course. Uh, specifically, I can't, I can't be having the new through the keyholes, uh, hosted by uh, the guy from Bo Selector. Um, I can't, I can't do that. It's not, it's not. It's just now, now it's like a comedy show. There's no quiz element to it at all. It's sort of incidental whose house it is. Um, I liked it anyway. Where it's David Frost, who seemed quite classy in the '80s, and Lloyd Grossman, and then there was. Um, then he was replaced for a little while as well. But the, the original ITV ones were quite high profile, quite good panelists mm. guessing. Uh, so I should, I should point out that the, the format of the show is that uh, David Frost introduces a panel of celebrities who are asked to guess whose house it is by a series of clues that are given by Lloyd Grossman, who would walk around the house and try and kind of sort of give you some red herrings, but also perhaps give you some tips as to whose house it might be as we take a privileged peek behind closed doors That's as, uh, David Frost used to say um, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, um, the ITV series are quite good it was quite high profile and it ra ran for a couple of years on ITV and then it just went away completely and then was revived I think in the sort of 
late 90s, early 2000s as a daytime BBC show. And then it was, that's when I really got into it because um, it was when the Paddle of Celebrities uh, became uh, quite, quite low level, quite low level, quite minor celebrities. And that was uh, coupled with the houses of the people going around being celebrities of such a minor nature that there was no way you'd be able to guess whose house it was. No, you wouldn't unless be able you... to guess if they showed you whose house it was. You'd be like, I, yeah, don't, yeah. I don't know who that is. Yeah. Yeah. You st I still don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but that was, that was my era for it. And I realized because, because I was um, unemployed or a student at the time, I, I probably had a much better idea than any of the panelists would have. Cause it'll be like, Oh, it's that guy who does like flowers on, um, on this morning or something. It'll be like, <laughs> like, it, it, like it will be so like, like when, when they do it, you'd have to do this thing there where when it gets to the end, uh, David Frost would have to try and go, yeah, I think you're getting it. I think you're getting it. And then it, it almost like have to like say the name and that the panelists have to be like, Oh, it's da Dave, Dave, Dave Chalk, Dave Chalk. Yeah, here he is. I definitely think they fed them a cue card if they didn't get it yeah. in a while because there'd be always be like one person would be like, Oh, do you know who I think it is? I've just had a thought. Is it this not famous person? And they go, Yes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Once uh, I saw it, and the guy was a guy called Paul Elvis Chan who was a Chinese Elvis impersonator. And it was like, I mean, there's just, there's no hope of anyone getting it. <laughs> They're not remotely famous. <laughs> my, uh, I, I said this uh, on stage, but my, um, the house I grew up in was once on through the keyhole, which was a, a, an extraordinary <laughs> moment for me. And, and the decor was exactly the same. So it had like in my room, there was like a Muppet show lampshade and things. And it was just like I was watching. It was the most sort of surreal thing to see. Um, and it was a house in a place called Cutherston in Cumbria, which uh, a woman called Hannah Hawkswell, who was in lots of documentaries, uh, she moved into the house after we moved out. But she had uh, lived on on the kind of moors and she had no heating or electricity. And when she uh, became too old to sort of manage the farm with no uh, no modern conveniences, she moved into the house that I grew up in after we moved out. But she, because I think due to the sort of sparse nature of her own upbringing, she didn't change anything about the decor whatsoever. So it really was like a weird shrine to just things that had been left. I just remember you left. saying like, you know, who would live in a house like this? And you were like, me. <laughs> 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 it was yeah uh but it's a great show in that period i would watch it every day i absolutely loved it and it was a generally quite it felt like quite a classy show and it almost felt quite sorry for lloyd grossman and uh david frost having to sort of try and talk up uh the house of a celebrity that no one in the studio had ever heard it of. had regular team captains right because it had willie rushton willie rushton i think was like sort of regular he yeah he seemed to be on most of them mm. chris tarrant was on it a lot mm. eve pollard was on it a lot yep. claudia winkleman's mum. um but there was a sort of kind of rotating group of people that would be on it occasionally my number four is going for gold with henry kelly and going for gold ran from 1987 to 1996 and like i, I love a bunch of things about it the number one thing that was great about it is not for Brexit voters. It was a celebration of Europe. You know, it have seven mm -hmm. contestants from around Europe. They all spoke impeccable English, wherever they were from. Uh, <laughs> and they would normally trounce any uh, home nations contestants. Cause I think you did appear as England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. I don't think they had British contestants. I think they were split okay. into the home that nations. Makes sense. I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure. And, um, yeah, it was just a quiz show. It was just a quiz show with, you know, a number of rounds of elimination. And if you got through to the final round it was a head to head, I think. And then you'd, you'd kind of go through the round, you'd get into it and there'd be a final final. And then you'd really be like the champion of Europe. And it felt to me as a kid, like it was always a Dutch woman winning. I don't know if it was actually always <laughs> a Dutch woman winning, but the Dutch 
contestants would just smash it and know everything about every other culture in Europe and you'd just be like mind boggled that they could know so much about everyone else's stuff. But it was it was a fantastic show with an incredible theme tune. I think that and that matters yes. in a game show. Do you know who did the theme tune? I don't. I can look that up. Hans Zimmer. Oh yes, I did Hans know Zimmer, that. The film I co- did know that. I did know that. <laughs> Hans Zimmer did the theme tune. My oh, God. But that's that's part of the kind of pan European uh, yeah you beauty of it, you know. And Henry Kelly, like a professional Irishman, just brilliant. Um, always liked Henry Kelly, especially later on when I got to know our friend Tony Lee, which is massively oh yeah Henry Kelly. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah it's just right um yeah and uh yeah just a big fan of it it had a it was a funny time of day it was quite early in the morning on a, on a weekday yeah, it, was. it was like a 11 or 10 or something you know it was not long after your morning tv is wrapped up and you get going for gold and they relaunched it with newsreader john Suchet, who i do not like um and it um. ran for a couple of years in the 2000s but I don't mind Suchet, but I don't like I don't like the sound of he it. He doesn't suit a game show. Doing. I don't know. It, it it wasn't good. It didn't last. It lasted maybe one season, something like that. Mm. But in its prime, it had a really gaudy, ugly set. It didn't have nice graphics, like you know something you give to to Family Fortunes. Is it had very very uh, basic visuals, a bit the big board. It was almost like a train station, you know what do you call it display board oh yeah yeah, yeah, in yeah a train yeah. station what are they called? like a, a departures and arrivals departures board. and arrivals like that with the big cross and everything coming up but it, at least it it was solid going for gold didn't really stick in the mind visually apart from the the intro but uh, it was a good show i um uh it was also because it was pan-european i presume it was shown in various different oh, yeah, european it was. countries it was shown all over europe yeah okay that makes sense i think i went to I did some stand-up gigs in Copenhagen once, and uh, I was shocked there that the TV um, seemed to be all in English. And I was like, there was one channel that seemed to be um, in Danish, whereas all the other was, it was like the same as daytime TV here. Mm. It was all the same shows with no subtitles. It was all like hairy bikers. (laughs) So it'd be like, it it was all those kind of shows, but like with no subtitles or anything. And I remember flicking through it and it was like, Wow, it's like Channel One, Danish. Channel Two, Harry Bikers in English. Channel Three, Antiques Roadshow in English. Channel Four, Hardcore Pornography. <laughs> that was it. That was one of my that. that seemed to be Danish TV. Um, it was just, and it'd be like it's like it's like ten in the morning. This shouldn't be. <laughs> What's going on on this Channel Four? Uh, but I guess that makes sense then. I guess other, and that would be. I mean, the disadvantage, presumably, for all non-English speaking people, the questions were all in English. So they would beat people from the British Isles on in a language that wasn't even their first language. But I think this is the way it was. I think they were like the creme de la creme of quizzes from around Europe and some British people. You know what I mean? I don't right. think we were sending the cream of the crop. I really don't. I think it was like, you know, the Netherlands hottest and I, like I say, the Netherlands doing well. I mean, that's a country where they speak impeccable English and everybody speaks sure. English. And, and I think I don't remember countries with much less English speakers doing as well as the, I think it was like the Netherlands and up, you know what I mean? It would be like Danish and Norwegian and Sweden doing really well. That's how I remember it anyway. I, I couldn't say I'd yeah. watch them all, but it's definitely, if it came on, I was watching it hundred percent. Yeah. I really liked their um, question format of the who am I, what am I, that uh, given more, you're given more clues, in which case you'd have this sort of uh, almost like jug that of, of what seemed to be almost like uh, a sort of image of, of the points going down. Mm. And then when you hit a certain point, you'd, it's now for five points, mm. as Henry Kelly would give out clues as to who or what you might be. Yeah. No, it, was, it had a few good rounds. I mean, yeah, I, I, I will. I'm not above watching an episode on YouTube every now and again. Like yeah, I could get I my could. little Henry Kelly fix and think back to happier European times. My number three is no win, no fee. 
I don't know if you remember this show. I remember it was another daytime show, probably from the same era that I was watching. In fact, it kind of makes sense if that, that it was probably of the era of watching uh, through the keyhole. Another daytime BBC show, No Win, No Fee, was hosted by Paul Ross. And the great premise of it was he plays the contestants. And if he don't win, he doesn't get paid. <laughs> great format. Absolutely brilliant. The host of the show has to beat the contestants or else he goes home with nothing. God, I loved it. I loved it. It felt like I can't believe it wasn't more popular. I think it was a great format and should have been prime time. Yeah, it sounds because like it a has real format. jeopardy. Yeah. It's got real jeopardy to it. You know that he wants to. And it's not as if it's someone who like you think of as being like a multi-millionaire. Right. If it was Ant and Deck, or if it was you'd be like, ah. Oh. If it was Jonathan Ross, you'd be like, yeah. he's happy to lose that money. If it was Paul yeah. Ross, it's Paul Ross, you're like, yeah. he needs that. I know he needs that because he'll go, you know, to the opening of a cardboard box. Like he, he yeah, so do anything. It's, there's more jeopardy involved yeah. with it when it's Paul Ross. But the great thing about it, which was also another, it was a real showcase for Paul Ross because I didn't realize like he's a great quizzer. And as as you probably would be if you're hosting that show, mm. so he rarely lost. Mm. Uh, I don't know if he also maybe maybe he vetted some of the contestants to be a bit like not that guy, not her, too clever, too clever. I'll have him. Um, but like it was a great idea for a show. Apparently, I'd read that it's Jeremy Beadle did a similar show on ITV, but that never felt like. I think it doesn't. It was one called Win Beatles Money mm. that re didn't really take off. And it had a similar premise where you were winning money off him. But I think that was pre-earned money. And I don't think it worked as well. And maybe that was because it was Paul Ross and you did feel like Paul Ross wants to win. Mm. He doesn't want to go into work and not get paid. I guess it's interesting because you think of something like Eggheads or The Chase. They have a similar premise. Mm. They don't have the you lose your money, but they've got the kind of recurring person that you're playing against. You know what I mean? You want to beat the Eggheads because mm. they're no annoying know-it-alls and they're always there. And you want to beat yeah. the, 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 the chaser in The Chase, you know, because they're a cartoon obnoxious character, you know? Yeah, I, but I think in The Chase, I, it would make it would almost make more sense if they made that the the forfeit in the chase because mm. i find it weird when it's like a celebrity chase or something and they've said they've gone on and said oh yeah i am playing for this very worthy charity mm. and the chaser still is desperate to beat them mm. so that itv give them nothing and it's like i mean it's for like a charity now yeah so i think they should almost make the chase it would work better if the chasers earned the money only if they win I think that's how they should switch it. It'd much, make much more sense. I don't really remember that show at all. I mean, I, I can picture the set and that's it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think many people remember it. I, it was just, it was a real must watch for me though. Cause as soon as you realize what it is, like for me, it's like premises, everything. It's like, perfect. I'm in. Yeah. And it's, there's some proper jeopardy you're watching. You really want to see, well, you know, I'm kind of happy both ways, really. I'm happy for, Paul Ross to come into work one day and get paid. But I'm also very happy for him to get beaten. You just because you feel it. Yeah. It's you're playing for something. You're playing, and it's where the host is more invested in a quiz show than I've ever seen a host invested in a quiz show. Yeah, that that would be good. It'd be good. You're right. It'd be good on a week on a like weekend primetime format where it was big money involved. You might imagine Chris Tarrant not getting his fee on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Yeah, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Yeah. Chris Tarrant does. You know, and he is, and he wants more. But you know, you can take his million off him. Yeah, but maybe it's right. Maybe the Beetle one didn't work for the same reason. Maybe it sort of works better as a more of a daytime one where you feel like the the host it's is like, I, 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 yeah, I have got a mortgage, so yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> got to win. My number three is shooting stars. Whoa. Yeah, shooting stars. You know, whoa, that's low. Shooting stars. I, I can't believe how long it ran because it feels like it's been gone a long time. According to what I read, it ran from ninety three to two thousand and eleven, on and off, on and off. Yeah, basically, I didn't realize it was that early, and I didn't realize it kept going that late. It was just like amazing. Obviously, Vic and Bob. 
presenting it and it was just great it's but it's really good game show while not mattering at all that it's a quiz or who wins or any of the challenges or any of that but no one was kind of shoehorned what we have now is like comedy panel shows where you get comedians on to tell some gags and build up their profile and all this kind of thing and it was just to be funny and no one who came on as a guest got any good promotion out of it you know what i mean like, no no nobody got to say i've got a new book out or this that and the other they just got to do stupid things and look stupid and it was all stupid and yeah the only person that did well out of it really was uh matt lucas who uh i don't know was he on anything before shooting stars he was doing little bits of stand-up i know but yeah i think mm. probably tv wise i'm pretty sure that'd be yeah. about the first thing he was on and it just like it's just given us like a million things that are just part of my normal language you know it's you're right i think i think if you're sensible like i think it was a good show to do and it was also a good show to be they're all right yeah that celebrity yeah. who you don't know if you're a good sport on that show it showed you in a good light but you... and if you took it badly it was like nah that guy's bad news yeah yeah that's it all you could do is but you only had stuff to lose really you know what i mean if, if people mm. already thought you were all right you only really had something to lose by going on there mm. and uh i don't just i don't know much to say about it but it was just hilarious and like for all the things that rick and bob have done it's probably my favorite it's not because it has all the best bits but just the general quality of it was always great and there's mm. tons of inventiveness in every every episode you know, when they cut away to their little sketch things and make, you know, Ulrika and Mark Lamar do stupid characters and stuff. Oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> I remember that it started, as you say, it did. It started in 1993, but it was, uh, that was the pilot that they did. I can't remember what it was on. I think they maybe had a night of TV and that was one of the shows. And in the pilot, the team captains were uh, Jonathan Ross and Danny Baker. Yeah. And then the series probably didn't start for another couple of years. And that yeah, the series was then with Ulrika Johnson and Mark Lamar. And then there was a big long gap, probably uh probably eight years or something where it wasn't on. And I think when it came back then it was it was Will Self and was it uh was it Johnny Vegas, I think. Will Self and Johnny Vegas, I think. Yeah. And I think it then had I'd another revival. That. Yeah much later where i think johnny vegas was replaced with jack d i think for like the last few series of it who was i think brought on to be like the sort of grumpy mark lamar type you know i think that was the idea i can't remember who who else hosted it but great show i mean absolutely done from a now on. donald cox the sweaty fox <laughs> uvavu he's a baby there's one thing I always say to my kids, which is from that, which is there's a, you know, when Matt Lucas would just shout something out to end the round, you know, when, when you hear this noise and he mm. just shouts something. And one of the ones he says on one of the early ones is, want a sweet? Suck your feet. And I, <laughs> when the kids are asking me for a sweet, I have to stop myself from being like, suck your feet. So it's not okay to talk to your kids like that. It's very bad. No, I love shooting stars and it just like, it's another one of those shows that you just think this is only in the 90s obviously it did get done later but only only in the 90s would a show like this come out and you know people were pissed on it people were really drunk on there mm. you know people were doing ridiculous things like they're making proper fools themselves almost ruining their careers and stuff and yeah crazy stuff <laughs> and it was like but kids could watch it it was pretty yeah yeah for everybody yeah, yeah very 90s i cannot fault your choice I cannot fault it uh, my number two is win lose or draw uh again all mine are quite daytime but i loved win lose or draw this one was on particularly early 9 25 it was 9 25 a.m on itv following uh, gmtv uh began with uh host danny baker was was uh, followed by uh, shane ritchie and was then followed finally by bob mills and it was one that 
it was a real making of Shane Ritchie for me, who I wasn't a, a, a particular fan of. But then when he did Win, Lose, a Joy, it's such a great format. Essentially, it's Pictionary. Mm. It's Pictionary with um, two celebrities and one member of the public. And it would be filmed in Scotland. So you'd be like, but the set was literally a, uh, a big pad. Yeah. And the celebrities wouldn't even have chairs. I remember. They had to like kneel. Yeah, they'd have to kneel on uh, on cushions. And it felt like it was just in someone's living room. Like it was incredibly yeah, small really space. really tiny set. Yeah. <laughs> there was a great show. Um, it was. I found it super addictive. And uh, I remember Tommy Boyd, uh, who is now, I think he's a talk radio DJ or something, but was then part of the Wide Awake Club or perhaps was, wasn't even part of the Wide Awake Club then. It was probably a few years after. Mm. But he was uh, he was superb. It was always good to see people who are really good at drawing. Yeah. And you just suddenly go, wow, they're actually really good at drawing. Yeah. <laughs> it was a neat skill. I remember once talking to Johnny Vegas. He was on it before he was famous. And I remember he was on it in the later years with Bob Mills. And actually, I remember Bob Mills as being a comedian. And said, oh, apparently you do stand-up, don't you? He said, yeah, I do it under the name. Uh, I said, do it under a stage name, though. And he goes, what's the stage name? And he said, uh, Johnny Vegas. And you could see Bob Mills pull in a face as if to go, that sounds dreadful. But obviously not quite understanding what the actor would <laughs> But I do specifically remember it. I remember like when he, when I'd later see um, Johnny Vegas on things, I'd be like, yeah, it's the guy. Oh, he's done really well. It's the guy from Win, Lose, a Draw. Yeah, because it wasn't, also, it wasn't celebrities as, as guests, was it? It was like... We'd have two members of the public, two members of the and, public and, and two yeah. celebrities. Yeah. So you'd sort of you'd, you'd have both all yeah. the time. Uh, celebrities often meet people who would be around Scottish television. So one of the celebrities is often Blythe Duff, who was the female police detective from Taggart, would often be one of the celebrity guests. So it was quite a Scott Scottish heavy celebrity quota. Yeah. Um, I think maybe you might get like a Nicky Campbell or someone like that doing doing a bit of uh doing it for a week uh but i loved when there's a draw i uh, yeah i i i'd get sucked into it every morning i think it's the right sort of time as well uh it, of, of to have a sort of lazy day it's probably probably the first thing i watched in, in that era of getting up to watch when there's a draw at 9 25 probably you're not up for boo breakfast then you get up after uh oh yeah no it probably would have been maybe it would have been maybe yeah be yeah i don't know it might be bob mills by then I'd, I'd mm. forgotten that Shane Ritchie did it, but I remember the other two. I think for a while, Shane Ritchie was doing lots of things after Danny Baker did it, as if he, he was like doing him a favor. Like Daz. <laughs> He'd like pass it on. Yeah, pass it. Did he? Uh, did he? I think yeah, he might have he done did Daz. Daz. Yeah, yeah. After, after Danny Baker. Yes, that makes sense. It was like he was always handing the baton mm. off to uh, Shane Ritchie, probably giving him a leg up for, for that bit of his career. My number two is Pointless pointless it's the most recent thing by far on my list um presented by alexandra armstrong and richard osman and also co-created by richard osman started in 2009 and it's essentially a reverse family fortunes like there's no families mm -hmm. involved but you have to come up with the correct answer that is the least obvious while still being correct and that format to me is just fantastic because you do you do it's good to get the answer right but it really rewards you for knowing more and that's a mm. that's way more interesting than just getting an answer correct is making yeah. a choice between a safe bet and a wilder one and so un, unlike anything other than maybe mastermind or university challenge you get really crazy knowledge on there from normal people but it'll be something that they know about and they'll be like oh i actually really know about italian cars so i'm gonna say this one i'm not gonna say a ferrari i'm gonna say uh i don't know about italian cars so you know like sure. I, lo I love that about it and it doesn't have again it's a daytime one or at least it was originally that i think they do some specials that are a bit more mm -hmm. high profile but it has that kind of no one's to be ashamed. No one's getting mocked for getting it wrong. Exactly. No one's getting it mocked for sh having more information. Like on, a lot, on some game show, really mainstream game shows, it would often seem like, oh, look at you knowing the answer to things, you know? 
that's just naff. Like it, 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 yeah. it, pointless is great for being like, well done. That's some pretty impressive yeah. knowledge. And you would get stats afterwards from, from Richard Osman telling you like, well, you could have had the most obscure one, which is this, or, you know, you did well to get that one. Cause only 1% of people got that one. So it's like a, it's a, it's a quiz nerds quiz. Yeah. But it's all you're after. You want to get a pointless answer. Is the is the plan, isn't it? You want to get one that none of the hundred have come up. None with. of the hundred. That's the challenge. And it's also a show that you can't. You couldn't say, "Oh, I'd be good at that," because I could do it. Watch one and be like, oh, "I'd smash this," and the next one will be like sport, and I'll be like, "I've no idea." Yeah, absolutely. But I think no it idea. does. It's one that you're watching makes you go, "I want to do this. I want to have a go at this." You know, I I really like if the question if you got the right questions, you could do amazing. Yeah. But yeah, equally, it could be it could be terrible. You could just be you could be totally unlucky and have a, a shocker. Yeah. Or if the right questions come up, you have a great one. No, it's a really good show. I I, I always like Pointless. Uh, what the reason I wouldn't have had it on mine is because I know that of five o'clock now that I will always drift to the chase, even though I don't think it's as good. A, I don't think it's technically as good a show, but I w- that's what I would watch instead of Pointless. No, I'm, I'm, I'm. I've been attracted by Bradley Walsh. He's a. Uh, he's uh, won me over. No, no, I'm. I'm. I'm all pointless all the way. I, I. It's like the only quiz show to really grab me in a long time, in, in probably in the 2000s or something. I. I think it's fantastic. Mm. And great format. Is it's, it's just a can't, great format. Can't fault it. And I had the board game of that. It was rubbish, because you need somebody there who has access to all the hundred different answers. You can't just have. It didn't uh, work. Yeah. It really wasn't good. The ball game. They hadn't. They hadn't figured it out. And you needed an app to. No, you need an app to do the timer or something. It was naff. It just no. Straight to the charity shop. No good. I would like to see if there's a going for gold board game though. Now that I'm thinking about board game. Oh, there was. Yeah, there must That's have been. That's an right? eBay, eBay job. Yeah. Shooting stars board game must have been. Maybe a DVD. Yeah. Maybe a DVD game. Like maybe a DVD game. DVD game. Yeah. And we've had the we've got the Family Fortunes board game, which comes with the buzzer. Oh yeah, yeah. You'd be disappointed if it didn't. No, it did. It comes with the buzzer, but you know, after a while, the battery starts to run out, and then it's like. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, but this, we do have a whole other top five top five board games based on game shows. Yeah, board games might be one. That's a big. That's too big. Too big for one. It's in, <laughs> mount it down. Narrow it down. <laughs> What's your prestigious winner and champion of the top five game shows? Uh, my number one is Shooting Stars because I just couldn't. I think it's one that, as soon as it's eligible, if I'm being honest, it's definitely better. Do you know what I mean? Of of them, you'd be like, you know, certainly uh, the ones I've picked. To be fair. I would I would watch, and I think that's that's uh, uh, that's difficult with, with uh, game shows because they they would rarely be appointment TV. Mm-hmm. Although the ones I've picked, I'd say probably with the uh, exception of my number five, you bet. I don't know if I'd watch that if it came back for an hour every week, but the others I would be happy to tune in for. Shooting stars, I wouldn't miss. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that was like a pro- that was a, such a great TV show, and again because it was sort of elevated above being a game show because it wasn't really a game show there was no consequence to it as you say um and i think it was it was the thing that really put reeves and mortimer on the map i think because it was in a really recognizable form i think when they yeah. did stuff like smeller reeves and mortimer and vickery's big night out that stuff was so way out for the mainstream that they couldn't quite get their head around it it worked for like a cult audience but it wasn't really until they um they put them in a format that was recognizable to yeah. the public that really sold it to them. And then every suddenly they're like national treasures by the end of mm. it because people love it. They but like it's a silly format. But the things they've done format. the things they've done since haven't hit as as big either. You know, what I mean it that was no. that was the thing which that was the vehicle for which they could be sort of mass mass appeal, yeah. which they aren't probably in general. They are kind of yes, weird yeah. art school y sort of, you know, niche. Yeah. You know alternative things but that did that they were that was massive it was massive but but it um but exactly it did that and it's it sold it to, and, and as you say that is still the thing that they're probably most famous for 
And it's because they were still able to do what they do within that format. So there was something like there was something special about what they created, even though I'm sure when they did the first series, they thought it was like a bit of a knockabout mm. kind of series that they weren't they didn't think would be a big deal for them. But yeah, it was it was absolutely the thing that kind of sold them mm. to the public. Um, and yeah, just such great moments in it all the time. The one I think about is um, Larry Hagman from Dallas was on it once. And he obviously had no idea what he'd signed up for. And at one point, Bob Mortimer asked him, are you going to have a word with your agent after this? And Larry Hagman just looks furious. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I will. <laughs> if they had a few American guests on it, it would be like, oh, this doesn't work. You know, like yeah. you, you, you didn't know what you could. But even British guests would be like that. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But it, but it also, the strength of that format is that it works whether the guests are into it or not. Mm. If they're not into it, it's a whole other thing. Yeah. It's sort of funny that they don't, they don't do it. And yeah, as you say, like the sketches on it were, um, were just superb. And there'd be like, mm. um, and they were much more, I think that was perhaps, am I right to say? No, that's not true. I was going to say, is that when they started doing TV parodies, they were already kind of doing that kind of stuff. And I'm sure Geordie Jean started on, uh, uh, Jean. Shoot stuff. <laughs> sure. All that stuff. Um, but yeah, just 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 an absolutely superb show. And I think, and and again, this I know. I just say it's just at my number one, just because unlike the others, this was like I, you know, I could watch this for on a loop for the rest of my life. I think. Yeah, and it doesn't it's, wear out because the because it because no. neither the the format nor the nor the the competition is what you're watching oh. it for. You're watching it for the entertainment of the two hosts yeah and what they get out of their their cast that is just limitless and yeah. you know there were a lot of comedy panel shows before them and they've obviously been a lot since and they're huge now as a as a format you mm. know i mean and you know i mean there's ones i watched all the time in the 90s i would watch um the sports one what was the sports one not not questions they think, it's all yeah, they think it's all over i'd always watch that do i think it was great no but i'd always watch it mm. And, but it was so inferior, you know, and obviously yeah. you've got Nevermind the Buzzcocks, which is probably its closest relative and mm. had a kind of crossover with, with having Mark Lamar for a long time and that kind of thing. But nothing like as the good natured yeah. and, and just purely entertaining and funny and inventive. And I think that's why there's a lot of there's one I might bring up in my honorable mentions, even there's uh, comedy panel shows. But really, the problem is with it, the, the others can't match a top five because it's like you're you're it's almost like it's impossible to not be outclassed by shooting stars and as soon as that's in your in your top five it's going to push all the others out because it's just way better it's on a it's on a different level mm -hmm. it doesn't compete that's it it's almost it's number one for me because it doesn't compete with anything else it's totally out on its own uh it, and if you try and put it up against other things well it's definitely better then yeah if you had to like it's uh and that's why it's my number one I, but what is yours i just want to talk one more thing about shooting stars i did rewatch some recently and <clears throat> like watching many 90s things you realize how far we've come with sort of sexism even if played for mm. half sexism so it has a lot of jim being like you know he's rubbing his legs and being all sleazy to joe guest or whoever's sitting in the seat nearest to him and all that and that was like riffing on sleaziness and stuff but it doesn't watch well now, you know, and right. it really reminds you of kind of where we were at with, you know, objectified women and that kind of thing in the nineties in your yeah. GFI Friday era in your gladiator loaded, all, magazines. loaded magazines, all that sort of stuff. And it, and, and that, that's the one thing on it where you go, Oh, this really dates it. That, that, that really dates it. Everything else about it, you go, this is, this is still absolutely top. We could go out tonight on the TV, but the, the, it's interesting to see the way, they handle comedy about women and sort of sleaziness. That's the one thing where you go, oh, this, you just wouldn't, you just wouldn't write this now. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, and yeah. it's progress. It's good. But it's one thing where you look back on it and you go, oh, I don't think of that much as having changed from the late nineties to now, but that is absolutely, absolutely big difference. But even with it's just phenomenal. My number one is the absolute diametric opposite of the entertainment 
hilariousness and wildness of shooting stars it is the tamest most low on entertainment quiz show ever it's 15 to 1 with william g stewart absolutely <laughs> love 15 to 1 15 to 1 ran for my entire life as far as i was concerned like it ran from 88 to 2003 right so all of the time when i would be watching something in the was it uh, straight after neighbors Mm -hmm. Great after neighbors yeah, yeah switch to switch the channel 15 to 1 just 15 people quick fire questions you get two wrong you're out and your light goes off you're all at your little podiums if you get two wrong in the first round your lights go off and they are i think they ask 40 questions in the first round and then and then yeah whoever's left in goes through to the next round and then they cut it down to i think a head to head and then the last round is a one i like those questions where they just have one person left in the last round and you're trying to get as high a score as you can so you can get on the leaderboard and get brought back for the final or the semi-final or whatever so it's a battle against other people but really it's just a battle with yourself you know and the the, the what 15 to 1 was just great for watching and shouting answers at the screen i still think it's the best quiz show for just going like canterbury red you know, 1942, you know, you just, it's just like that. You just like, and William G. Stewart, completely dry guy, mm -hmm. you know, kind of quite interesting guy when you find out anything about him, but he, he didn't give you anything on the show. He was just yeah. a man with some cue cards and he was not messing about. And it was the kind of show yeah. where they didn't even sign off at the end. It was like, goodbye. And that was it. I do like that. It's very lean shows. Channel Four was very good at that. To be, I mean, Countdown was basically that to begin with. It's become a bit more kind of cozy and fuzzy since. But it, essentially, it is when they'd be like, "Hi, it's Countdown. It's the words and numbers game." It's like that's what it is. Yeah, that's, that's Countdown. Is. The, the the dictionary corner guest bit kind of just expanded into what it is now yes. it's like a, it's almost like a panel show kind of it's a spot for someone to promote their thing, and that's fine. Mm. But fifteen to one just kept it real straight to the point it to me it's that it's still the ultimate quiz show it's run through it and it had that i don't know what you call it like repechage format where if you lost yesterday you could come back on the next day and have another go you know that i love that format in game shows because you you oh i love it you you watching them and you oh, it's the guy from yesterday who got that one embarrassingly wrong he's done all right mm. today i you know i'm i'm, I'm rooting for him that, 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 it's yeah. actually one of the things i really like about pointless to mm. go back to that that they say Oh, well, you can come back another time. I go, great, because it is that thing where it is like, I was just unlucky and you can prove it. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And you get, you know, <laughs> or some of them you have them throughout the week, the same people, and you get to know them yes. a bit more and stuff, I think. And you know that in reality, they're all filmed in one day, right? They're not mm. coming back for five days. They're, they're all filmed on one day. They're back after their tea break. Yeah, they're after tea break <laughs> and a change of shirt. You know, so uh, the, it's, yeah, I just think 50, 15 to 1 had 33,975 contestants in, in 2,265 episodes. Yeah. Like, that's incredible. And you know what's the maddest thing about it, right? So it was William G. Stewart, and then at the end of the round, a woman would do a voiceover to say, like, what the scores were and who was winning, right? Her name was mm -hmm. Laura Calland, and William G. Stewart married Laura Calland. Oh, well, it's the... Uh... It's a feel-good story of the year. It's just like, I don't know, I haven't done the maths on it. She might have been 14 and he was 70, but I mean, <laughs> it might not be that happy of a story. But like, it just, to me, it's like the kind of no-nonsense of it. I reckon he was just like, I work with you every day. Should we get married? Yes. That was, you know what I mean? Just no-nonsense. Just <laughs> I can say we can save on petrol. Quick fire round. Will you marry me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was old school TV, right, William G. Stewart? He was, I think... He, I think he used to like direct or produce like sitcoms and things. So he was probably a proper TV studio guy, like worked in, like actually worked in the studios. Yeah, he was. A, and then I guess at some point, did he come the, up with the format as well? Do you know? I don't think he did come up with the format. No, I may, may have done. I did. I did do some research into it. It's a nice, it's a nice idea though of someone who's just like, my job is TV. And it's just a guy like, I guess I'll host this now. It's like kind of, um, it's that kind of, yeah, you, you know, it's, it's, it's TV when you think of it like a job, you know, it's that like, there's loads of people that work in TV and that's their whole career. And um, they're not, it's not sort of celebrity based. It's sort of technicians and 
people vision mixers and plenty of people and it's all part of that kind of that thing i find quite uh, a romantic idea of like the itv or bbc studios or the you know the 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 donut and all those people working in white city for the bbc or i guess it channel four it's horse ferry and all that and just those studios and all those yeah as i say all those technicians and cameramen mm. and all that for them it's a job and they do that mm. one day but then they're going on to something else the next week and it's just like loads of guys whose job it is to make this like high um celebrity showbiz world that they're living in mm. but they're kind of technicians and i feel like william g stewart is sort of from that world but he's kind of crossed over a bit to to be like the host yeah was, albeit a dry one a dry host it's, it's, but that's great it suits it it's 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 a bit like richard osman who was you know like a a, a producer right and producing mm. reality tv shows and, and game shows and stuff and then he did the demo for for pointless and the the bbc people were like oh no you should do it like you should present it yourself and he was like oh, i don't know i'll get alexander armstrong in to do the, the main bit but I'll, I'll sit on the desk sort of thing and hadn't done anything like that before i just looked up william g stewart and he was yeah director and producer on things he he uh, directed the frost report and uh, you know did love thy neighbor and he hmm. family fortunes he produced family fortunes don't forget your toothbrush the price is right so he really you know he really had a big career as a producer and then also um had an incredibly long run i reckon must be the longest run of presenting a, a game show in the uk or at least i know that with um uh countdown i forgot his name yeah yeah richard whiteley richard whiteley yeah so he died in in the seat didn't he i mean he he, he died yeah, on the yeah. job it must have been a similar length yeah yeah but william maybe that's it maybe that's a sign to retire the one thing i remember about william g stewart is you'd see him on the news because his pet his pet thing was talking about the elgin marbles and how they should be returned to greece you know the path oh, yeah. marbles in the british museum that was his like thing for life was be like it's a completely indefensible position and we must return them to the greek government you know and it'd be like this incredibly unpopular thing to say and he'd be like going on channel 4 news being like Yes, I'll, I'll come and speak to you about why we should. It was always like, it's, that's the guy 15 to 1. Why is he talking about the path on the marbles? You know, it, 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 it's just his hobby. You're right, though. I, I know it did. they did revive it, didn't they, 15 to 1, with Sandy Toxvig, I think? Yeah. Uh, but I never I never really watched it again. The, the, I guess I guess it's that. I, I like Sandy Toxvig. Mm. I've got a lot of time for her. But it does feel like once you get someone like that, she is almost the definition of nice, cozy presenter yeah she's too personal and i mean that in a positive that. way no, yeah, yeah she's she, very personal you need yeah. somebody very cold and and to the point business-like like william mm. g stewart he did, to do it stunning stunning uh stunning format just if you like quizzes that's like that's like me and my sister we'll get a box of trivial pursuit get the questions out ignore the the game board the rules. just get the cheese holders out yeah get your cheese holders out get a wad of cards and just go backwards and forwards and if you get if you get the question right, you get your cheese from that one. But we just go backwards and forwards. One question, one question, one question, one question. And you probably, there's six cheese holders in the board. So if you are in a good stay up all night session of it, you fit first to fill up three cheese holders with the six different colored cheeses. That's that's almost a 15 to one is that. It's just questions. No, no nonsense. Did you have any um, also no rants, any honorable mentions? So, twice? so many, so many. And I thought of one while we were yeah, talking that I was like, Oh, I should have had that on my list. I think probably I should have bumped off Family Fortunes and had Catchphrase. Great format. Again, I struggle with things when they're not hosted by the the person and I like though. I feel like Catchphrase you, is another one. You now, didn't which... like Roy Walker. You ignored no. him. You didn't like him. Yeah. I can't think of anybody that comes across as a more unpleasant person while presenting a game <laughs> show. Um, and towards the end of his run, he was really running out of patience with people. He really was. He was, he was like, getting angry. Answer the question. It was just like, he, he was just like, come on, look at the screen. Like, it, you know, come on. Stupid. It people. really was. I remember, I, I remember find that really amusing at the time. Oh, very. And it is. That's that's for, that's absolutely for real. I, I, I'm sure you can't find clips that are that specific on YouTube or something. But I remember that because he stopped saying it's good, but it's not right. He'd just be like, "No, 
Yeah, yeah. Look at the screen. <laughs> you know, we that. what is it's Mr. Chips doing? It's Look at this. Oh, he's there. Is. Look at him. What's he doing? <laughs> like, he was just, he had no patience for it. And again, the, the stuff on screen looked awful on, on, on catchphrase, but the noise, the boom, that was amazing. Oh, yeah. That, that probably, <clears throat> that might be the best noise up there. But also followed by. Yeah, great. Yeah, great noises. And the one with Mr. Chips having a wank is one of the great course. comedy clips course. in all of in all of game shows. Uh, especially because it's it's working on lots of different levels. Of that there's uh, the, the woman who's not seeing what everyone else is seeing. Um, <laughs> that's a lot of fun. But she's sort of laughing as if she does know, but she obviously hasn't. She doesn't know. Right, she Ray, keeps Ray, coming Ray, out with Ray guesses Roy Walker and the other that fella. aren't yeah. related to the fact that it looks like Mr. Chips having a wank. But yes. they are hilarious because almost if you think it's somebody having a wank, then anything you say sounds like innuendo and is hilarious. Yeah. That's a, one of the great clips of all time. Oh, great. Yeah. There used to be a thing that um, our friend John Chandler uh, introduced me to, and it's now gone from YouTube. It's a shame, which was a thing called Catchphrase Slow. And it was basically the opening of Catchphrase slowed down to like a, a huge amount. Like and that to me was... Like two hundred percent, and that to me was, was my absolute kryptonite. Watching that, <laughs> and it would it would absolutely have me on the on, my, on the floor. I don't think I've ever seen anything funnier, <laughs> and I'd like someone to find it. I remember all of the ones, and it would give the example of uh, you know at the start of catchphrase. Part of it was every week you'd have the theme tune, but then you'd also have an example of what a catchphrase is, and it'd have a different one every week to sort of go, this is the kind of thing, and this one was. Um, uh, a pint of beer with like and it explodes and just very slowed down you just said the voiceover go mine's a pint <laughs> and it used to kill me it used to absolutely kill me but great yeah great one catchphrase yeah, yeah. i mean that's probably a show which is perhaps never even found its uh its ultimate host yet so there's probably all to play for the catchphrase i've just remembered something about catchphrase i went when i was doing my gcse's we went on a geography field trip you know like stayed for two nights or one night in a i don't know like an outward bound center or something like a hostel or something in the in the peak district and it was like but there was like an incredible snowfall and this is the most snow i've ever seen in this country was like properly above your waist kind of snow and we had to be going out on like these mountains and gathering information about screed screed pebbles and stuff and it was like they're under four feet of snow like there's no way um but it was pretty mad being out in all the snow and freezing to death and then we went back so we were staying in this hostel and they had like a kind of uh sitting room bit where you could go with a tv a tv room kind of thing and we were all piled in there all the kids from my year most of which i didn't like you know and they were choosing what was on TV and they're arguing over the remote, right? And they were flicking between a couple of things. And after a while flicking, Countdown came on and I was like, that's it. You gotta watch Countdown. Catchphrase. I mean, sorry, yeah, Catchphrase. Catchphrase came on, I was like, that's it. You gotta watch Catchphrase. And like all the kind of, all the kind of blokey boys turned around like, what? You know, what Catchphrase? And I was just like, I've just lost it. And I was like, you fucking idiots. Like you got to watch catchphrase. It's the best, it's the best one. That's the best thing we could watch right now. It'd be funny. And, and then I realized like everyone in the room had just gone silent was looking at me go mad about catchphrase. And I think, I think whatever girl had the remote was just like, yeah, okay. You'll watch catchphrase. It's like, yeah, good. Good. It was good. It was a funny episode. I think everyone, you know, was pleased with my meltdown. Thanks Roy. But it was right. It's also the right thing to watch. It absolutely was. Absolutely. Um, was. Others on my list were uh, Monkhouse's Memory Masters. Do you remember that? Nope. Uh, Bob Monkhouse gets people uh, to, to work with like a mind expert, and it was doing all these kind of um, pulling things out of the air, and like, and you have to remember incredibly long sequences of things to win points great show and when you'd see it the guys would be like with their eyes closed and they're literally like clutching things out the air because they're obviously doing some sort of mind palace thing to get to the art oh, it's a great show normal people just given a little bit of coaching by some mind expert and it was just normal people reeling off 
massive bits of information. It'll be like a page of the phone book or something. It's all stuff like that. Probably incredibly boring to some people, but I found it great. Was it just to feel like, wow, totally normal people doing these kind of extraordinary mind things? Was it directed by Christopher Nolan? His, his, <laughs> yeah, his game show. Yeah, that should have had a Hans Zimmer soundtrack as well to be appropriate. Yeah, but not sounding like going for gold. No. <laughs> uh, Cluedo, I liked uh, with Richard Maybe hosting, uh, where you'd get actors playing, uh, sort of quite well known actors playing the characters from Cluedo, and each each episode would have a dramatized murder mystery, and then the, the contestants would interview the. Uh, uh, Professor Plum, all those kind of guys. Uh, um, I do that was quite. It, that. it was. It was basically. It, it was the same format as a '70s show called Who Done It, uh, but this was using the Cluedo characters. It basically revived Who Done It with the Cluedo characters. Wow, I don't. Oh, that that ran for a few. That ran for a few series. That was quite entertaining. I'm sure I watched it. I watched everything then. Very recent ones. The current one I like, The Masked Singer game show which has its cake and eat it totally silly totally ridiculous it knows it is mm. it plays on both levels of people who are joining it uh on one level and people who are joining it in a slightly ironic way it works it's very knowing very clever show really like it um one that uh um i was watching on um uh uh, what's it called? Talking Pictures TV, they're repeating recently, was the 70s children's game show uh, Run Around, which I'd get up for. And it's probably hosted by uh, EastEnders Mike Reed, Frank Butcher. Uh, and it's probably the most fast paced game show I have ever seen. So much happens in 20 minutes. It's like the whole of an episode of Going Live, like shrunk down into 25 minutes. It's literally like, here's a bloke in the car, get off. You've got to run around now. What's the answer to this question? Is is like a guy uh, who's going to show you a Spitfire? Go, go, go! You've done it now. It's like with <laughs> with like Frank Butcher shouting at people, Frank Butcher shouting at kids, and he's just sort of slightly inappropriate, having a go at the kids. Nah, it's all right. Don't cry. Kind of um, great host, great show. Only would really exist in that time. Mm. Um, very, very good, very entertaining to watch. Uh, the one who just missed out on my top five was one that I, I left out because I had uh, win, lose, a draw on, which is another originally hosted by Danny Baker, which was Pets Win Prizes, which was a, a great show. And it was just before things were like, you're allowed to have ironic things. So it was like a show that was about, the, the idea was that it would always go wrong, mm -hmm. but of course just made people go, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> like you can't control animals. Yeah. But that was the joke was that you can't get a, uh, it was like, I bet I can make a dog do this thing, but he's just, they're not particularly well-trained and they never work when they're on telly. So there'd be people like going, I can get my dog to sing. And it's like, go on then. And it would just be a man trying, like almost like pleading to get a dog to sing. And it was just that very knowing, but it's almost like, I think it was sort of mainstream kind of BBC One, whereas a show like that probably would have fared better on Channel 4 or, mm. or BBC Two or something, where you're kind of, where you're allowed to be ironic. But it was before that kind of, now it would work a lot better, I think. Mm. But I think at the time, it was sort of slightly ahead of its time. It was like You Bet with animals, wasn't it? Yeah. It could have yeah. been called You Pet. Yeah. That would have been, should have been. That would have been what you'd have done have if it was a spin off. <laughs> I've got a long list of things. I love the format of University Challenge, but I can't stand Jeremy Paxman. So I think he's leaving. So I might get into it but basically mm -hmm. i think i would have really liked university challenge if i was 10 or 20 years y yeah older you know before him i think it works as well as a, a show because it's either the contestants are either absolute sweethearts or monsters yeah depending absolutely. On what university they i go think to. that's the thing it it, it contains more unself-aware know-it-all wrong -uns than any other quiz show and they they because yeah. that's what most quiz shows i think they have to screen those people out you know the people that just win win them all you know i know i know at least one person that has been on all the quiz shows and is a real quiz show person and they really have been on them all and they clearly are blacklisted now like they can't get on anything you know they're not they're not having them because it's it's no fun and they don't carry it well do you know what i mean they they 
they seem incredibly smug and and uh, or they, they if they get one wrong they're like oh god damn it you know like it's like yeah. no it's it's, a, it's a entertainment you know and it, university challenge has a lot of that people like cursing themselves out or just looking like they're going to be sick because they got a question <laughs> wrong you know it's it's because that is that's all their lives are about off of absolutely like, or, or 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 the other alternative is always that you get super sweet people who are you know 18 or 19 mm. and they're just kind of they're slightly too young if, and uncomfortable in their own skin if I and you go ah oh, bless them if i was producer i would make it you have to be an undergraduate because the problem mm. they have there is with mostly masters students phds and and uh mature students and they make up a lot of the teams a lot of the time and it's like that's cheating let's have let's have let's say you've got to be a first year undergrad under 20 and now let's see what you know you know that that but then you would get a higher level of the awful ones, which, but that's often the most entertaining thing. So yeah, that's, it's a great show. Blockbusters. I really enjoyed it at the time. Yes. I don't think there's anything that special about it, but. um, No, I thought the two versus one was always an odd idea, but I was, I was there for it. I thought weird idea, yeah. but sure. Nice board with the hexagons and stuff. That was like a nice oh, a lovely board. visually for its time. That was top notch. And the thing. And a really strong theme really strong theme very good theme yeah i mean we you could still hum that one no problem and it hasn't been on mm. for a long time right a long time and even do the actions <laughs> i'm trying to do the actions it's not it's not going with no space here um a, a, a deep cut that i was really into but um when i reviewed it to see if it came out my top five it's not that special was uh turnabout with rob curling oh yeah yeah, yeah which yeah, was yeah. like a othello a multicolored Othello board based quiz game. It was good, but it's not like it's not an all timer. Mm. It's not an all time great. Sure. Uh, you say we pay off this morning with Richard and Judy. I think super. That's brilliant. Absolutely superb. That is a phenomenal thing because it's the the the, the format there is that the caller mm. has to there's something on the screen behind Richard and Judy, and the caller has to describe it without saying what it is. Yeah. And they have to guess. And the callers invariably didn't know anything. And Richard and Judy invariably wouldn't cotton on. And Richard would cheat most of the time by looking around yeah. and seeing what it was and going like, oh, well, it's a horse. It's a horse. A horse. And they, yeah. they count that as a correct answer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it really did. Play. And it would be like, I think it was like for a grand a question or yeah. something. So they, you would be like, yeah, you got 16 grand. And it'd be like, wow, well done. If you got the first three wrong, then Richard Maley is just going to do the rest for you and give you 12 yeah, grand. Yeah. It'd be like that. So it's yeah. not not a serious quiz show, and also there's the classic uh, Adam Buxton uh, overdubbing of "You Say We Pay," uh, which you can find on YouTube. You put Adam <laughs> yes, Buxton yes. "You Say We Pay" into YouTube. That's phenomenal. <laughs> Takeshi's. I think Carson. most game shows would uh, would benefit from being hosted by Richard Madeley, though. Probably, especially Takeshi's Castle. I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I almost I almost had Takeshi's Castle on on. Uh, on my list i think i didn't because it actually only ran for a few years in the late 80s i think it had one revival but we're only seeing reruns from a very long time ago and you know it's kind right. of it was a, a moment but that it, it's phenomenal like the, takeshi's castle is phenomenal and it's even better without the silly silly voiceover taking the mickey out of it it's it's funny enough on its own it doesn't need a silly mm. voiceover the, the thing of like going through all these crazy obstacles and stuff phenomenal and the idea that all of that is spearheaded by one of japan's premier cult actors and directors in the yeah sure Takeshi kitano is something else. i presume has probably won or been nominated for a palm door or something yeah i think it's, he's uh, got a palm door know. for for hanabi i think it's, it's like it's like having like um you know it's a knockout presented by mike lee or something you know or yeah it just yeah, doesn't yeah. make any yeah, sense yeah. in a it, <laughs> that's just it's amazing i guess the closest we got is something like crystal maze crystal mm. maze could have made the list oh yeah good show fort boyard was just another similar one fort boyard uh a forgotten one that i'm quite fond of that almost no one seems to remember was uh craig charles's cyber zone Yes, Cyber Zone. Cyber Zone, which had had contestants competing in very early virtual reality mm -hmm. games, most of which seemed to involve sort of running around a warehouse looking for a cube. <laughs> and 
they were the kind of virtual reality that they had in the Trocadero where you had to stand on a sort of travelator <laughs> with a massive headset on. It was bad, but it was a serious attempt to to push to the future and remains ahead of its time while also being incredibly dated. You've reminded me of things like Treasure Hunt with Annika Rice, uh, with the contestants in the studio, and she is armed with a helicopter doing a, a treasure hunt across one uh, at some kind of small area of the British Isles. That was quite a fun show. And later presented by that tennis player. What was her name? Oh, yeah. Um, Annabelle Croft. Yeah. She did it afterwards. She was very much the uh, Shane Ritchie to Annika Rice's uh, Danny Baker. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nightmare. Got to have Nightmare. Uh, of course, Nightmare. Children's yeah, yeah. sort of virtual reality Dungeons and Dragons game. That had Fantasy incredible game, yeah. production values for a children oh it really was like it when it started you'd never seen anything like it yeah um i once saw trey guard um he was signing copies of the nightmare book in the wh smiths on the plaza when i was a kid and me and my brother have a nightmare book signed to us and he signed it from trey guard but then in brackets has put you go wyatt um he put his real name in but it's nice of him to have put the character yeah first yeah I like I like that the kids. from all celebrities when they are more famous for their character, when they put yeah. it in brackets or something. I think that's a real like it's down to earth thing to do. Apparently, in the sort of um, early days of the Beatles, Paul McCartney would sign things. Paul McCartney brackets the Beatles, and I think yes. that's quite sweet. He didn't he didn't stop doing that till nineteen seventy eight. Night fever. Uh, oh, the Channel that? 5 karaoke show yes. hosted by Suggs uh, and uh, um, a tiny monkey. Um, yeah, the tiny <laughs> the monkey. Pop monkey. It was a man in a monkey suit who would dance while various 90s celebrities, Michelle Gale, um, uh, lots of characters Bar from, Barry from Brookside. Barry from EastEnders. Barry from EastEnders, someone off of Brookside, someone off of Hollyoaks. Uh, some very small celebrities are just sing karaoke four points. Yep. Great show. Great show. That was good. I think you've got to have gladiators in this category as well. I mean, gladiators, sure. gladiators is a hell of a show. And certainly the best of its kind. And now it's, it's very, uh, very much been copied over the years, but yeah. very much the, the daddy of those kind of shows. And a mastermind like mastermind mm -hmm. is super dry. It's really good, but it, it isn't that entertaining. And it's so bare bones that it's crazy. They literally go, you are the winner. Goodbye. You know, that's that, that, that does nothing. Tell us a bit about yourself. And they don't even say, tell us a bit about yourself. They say like, you enjoy horse riding and you are 22 years old. Uh, you did it and you know it's like let's get to know a little bit more about you huh you like uh, chips is that right yes i do good now here's your first question like it's <laughs> super minimal super minimal but it's obviously a brilliant show the krypton factor the one that challenges your brain and your body krypton factor is a weird one i was talking about this the other day and somebody who i was talking to didn't didn't remember it i guess it must have been my partner because it's covid and that didn't talk to anybody else but i i was <laughs> saying to her like yeah it was weird you did all these quizzes and then all it did was just give you a handicap, you know, like a time delay for starting the uh, assault the course challenge. challenge. Yeah. And then that was the winner. So it didn't matter if you were thick and you got them all wrong. If you were super fast, you could always <laughs> just catch up on that, you know, and, and yeah, it was a weird sort of uh, metaphor for life. I'm not sure it was a quite a right one, but it was, it was. Again, I thought when when you initially suggested it, I thought can't do game shows. There aren't any. Like I thought, I thought I couldn't hang my hat on many game shows. And then as soon as I sat down to do them, had tons, absolutely tons. Yeah, I've gone for all quizzes. I think that's just that I, I suppose shooting stars, not really, but I mean, I, I think that's what I prefer, but you could easily do a top five and go with all the kind of physical ones. You know, you could, mm. you could do all of that. I, I, I'm very fond of the ones that used to be on Saturday morning TV, uh, Double Dare. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Run the Risk. That kind of stuff, uh, and 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 uh, obviously ITV's uh, masterpiece Funhouse. <laughs> Funhouse was phenomenal, and 
another kids one that I liked was uh, your man uh, of Art Attack. I've got his name. Neil Buchanan's Neil, Finders Keepers. Finders Keepers of Neil Buchanan. That was a fantastic yeah, yeah, yeah. set because it was like a, a big house with all different rooms, but it was just a, a facade, you know, with a big TV audience there. And you sort of run through all these different rooms trying to find it all tokens or something yes it was yeah similar to crystal maze or something wasn't it for kids yeah and he i just remember he'd start he'd go raid the rooms <laughs> slogan it was great <laughs> i think kids kids game shows are quite good my kids watch uh swash swashbuckle which is a pirate based one um okay i don't find it very entertaining but they love it and uh the worst one in the world is giggle mm. quiz which is uh, Mr. Tumble's, it's a spin-off. Mr. Tumble had his spin-off uh, sketch comedy show, Giggle Bits, oh, yeah, where yeah. he rehashes sketch characters from the 80s and rips off Harry Enfield stuff that's 35 years old. And then uh, he spun off from that a quiz show presented wow. by his character Arthur Sleep. It's funny. It's terrible. My little one loves it. I just want to watch Giggle he's, uh, Quiz. He's got it sewn up over at uh, CBB, is that guy? That guy is printing money. Good luck to him. Good luck to him, <laughs> Mr. Tumble. I might go and watch CyberZone now. <laughs> yeah, I do. Do you think... It's all go and watch CyberZone. Did you include um, Games Master? Or is that more like... Is that more like... Oof, e I sort of is. No, it sort of is a game it's, show, it's, isn't it? It's eSports. It's these different mm. esports, but also it would have computer game news halfway through as well. It would have, and and Britain's preeminent astrologer, yeah, astronomer, astronomer. Yeah, yeah, well Number done. One. Yeah, I always get that mixed up, yeah. which is bad. Me too. It's like getting yeah. naturists and naturalists mixed up. <laughs> bad. It is bad news. That's worse, I guess, to get mixed up. Can be really awkward. Yeah. 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 Consequences are much worse. Yeah. Um, yeah, please let us know what your favourite game shows are because there's bloody millions of them. Millions of them. Some, a lot of them are pretty strong, as we've realised. Yeah, I don't like. Uh, I don't like some of the Americans, like Jeopardy. I don't like. I don't like Jeopardy. Yeah, I, I don't mind. I don't mind the idea of it, but I, I don't like the execution. But they have to do it in such a convoluted way to ask the question backwards. No, I'm not a fan of Jeopardy. I tell you what, I did like, but now it's cancelled. Was um, you bet your life. Sure, yeah. yeah, but you can't watch that now. It's terrible. Yeah, you bet your life was presented by Bill Cosby and had a giant crow that came down from the ceiling. But like, it was originally presented by Groucho Marx. It was a Bill Cosby revival of a of a show. But yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That ain't coming back. No. Yeah, I think that's all from me. Uh, please do all the things you're supposed to do with these things, like subscribe, tell people about it. Uh, if you want us to do any others. If you got any ideas for your own? Yeah, thanks to Dan. Uh, drop us a line. Thanks to Dan and Dave for this uh, this idea. We're definitely going to be doing more of your of your suggestions, listener requests. Yep. And uh, I, I feel like we should have some sort of game show sign off to to finish with. But I, I can't remember any. What's that catchy Bruce Forsyth one you had? You want to bet on it? You bet. <laughs> then you better get on it. You bet. So get ready. Get set. Are you ready? You, you bet. bet. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>